Mankind is at the turning point, the beginning of a new rationality in which science is no longer identified with certitude and probability no longer with ignorance. We are observing the birth of a science that is no longer limited to the idealized and simplified situations, which reflects the complexity of the world around us and a science which views us and our creativity as part of a fundamental trend present at all levels of nature. You were born in Russia, 1917, the year of the revolution. And uh, your first interest, you say, was music. Music and also literature, philosophy, history. You play the piano? Yes. Anything else? No. no. While playing music or dealing with music, already at that time you became interested or fascinated with the idea of time. Yes, but of course I didn't recognize the problem at this moment. You see, I began to recognize this problem when I was in the university. When I was in the university, as you say, I came to study, law, uh, study chemistry and physics rather unexpectedly that's related to the atmosphere before the war. And there I felt some, something strange. I felt that in some way the atmosphere in physics especially was so different from the atmosphere in philosophy. In philosophy, when I was adolescent, before the university, I read Bergson, I read uh, uh, Heidegger, I read uh, Kant. And the problem of time seemed to be very, very important. While in physics, it seems to play no role at all. And so I felt already at this time some kind of dichotomy. And uh, as I had uh, recently my 20 years of, of my Nobel Prize and my 80 years, so one of my co-workers, Isabel Stengers, presented me with three small papers, which I wrote 60 years ago, and were published in a student journal. And I already there speak about the problem. Of course, it's very naive, it's childish, but I say already one should have more unity between culture and science. And that is, I already mentioned the problem of time. Of course, I have no new, new solution. But for a layman, what, what is the problem really? We, I, I, I know physics uh, has time in it. Acceleration is with time. And what was exactly the problem, uh, or what was it that you lacked in physics that you found? Uh, well, physics contains physics. Is a relay, uh, speaking about the time, which is measured by motion essentially, and is a part of deterministic equations. The equations may be Newton's equation or Schrodinger equation. Deterministic or is that if, if we are at A, we know that we will get to yes, B with yes, this. Uh, yes, right. exactly. And when we go from A to B, from the point of view of fundamental physics, there is no reason that we could not go from B to A. It's only a question of initial conditions. We have to invert the velocities and we go back. Well, the, in the human uh, situations, the direction of time plays an essential role. A, a time-reversible world would be also an unknown, a world which we could not know. Because after all, acquisition of knowledge is an irreversible process. And, of course, all our human existence is around time, is around choice, is around freedom, after all, you see. And, uh, and I think, therefore, there is a very big difference between the time as presented in fundamental physics and the time of the philosophers. Mm. But there was, of, of course, we perceived this as the difference between dead matter which is which is for physics is for, and and biological life, which sort of was regarded as something different, perhaps. And yes, but it, it, that brings us to the problem of the unity of nature. 
I mean, if, if this is absent in the fundamental level, then how it will appear on a, some other level? The question is, is matter only determined by Newton's equations? After all, of course, the question is the universe ruled by deterministic laws. What is, the, what is the type of laws which we have in the universe? It's a very old question. But it seems that with Newton's laws, we have solved it. But you, one should not forget that Newton's laws are applicable only to a very small part of our universe. For example, and Newton knew it better than anybody else. Essentially, when we think about our planetary system, it is certainly uh, ruled, the motion of the planets are ruled by Newton's laws. We can send somebody to the moon and he comes back according to Newtonian trajectory. But there are other things, there's their life, there is ecology, there are diffusion, there are chemistry, and all this is not described by Newtonian equation. So when we say that Newton's equation were a very important event, and that was a very important event, followed by quantum mechanics and so on, we should not forget that what we see around us is much wider, much more rich than the situation where we can apply directly Newton's equation. Therefore, there is a problem. How can we go beyond? And there are two possibilities. Either we go beyond because we can show that there are some some, I would say, simplifications are involved in Newton kind of equation, or that they apply to only to simple situation. That means that we have to, to go to a generalization of classical or quantum mechanics. Yeah. Or we have to say it comes from our approximations. The other systems are very complicated. We cannot apply exactly the laws of, of uh, classical quantum mechanics. And it's through our approximations that we introduce irreversibility and some of the basic because, new features. It's because we don't know enough. We don't know enough. And you did not accept that. Uh, that I didn't accept because that would mean that finally irreversibility is man-made. Evolution is, we are in an evolutionary universe because of our approximations. And, we, and as I say in my book, uh, we, we would be uh, essentially the progenitor, the fathers of time, instead of being the children of time. But no sensible man would, will, would argue that history is reversible, that we could basically trace back uh, all the way to, to where, whenever, if we only had the initial knowledge. Who would say that in, in reality? No, no, but the question is a question of, of principle. You see, is is it arrow of time arising in, in approximations, or does it require a new fundamental physics? Now, we, of course, such kind of questions have to be discussed a little in a historical context. And I think there are two new elements which have appeared since this question was really brought up. This question was brought up by Boltzmann. Boltzmann, the great Viennese physicist, published a very famous paper in 1872, so it's 125 years, just 120, about 125 years ago. And he tried to do in physics what Darwin succeeded to do in biology, that is to describe an evolutionary universe. And then the people said to him, you are crazy. You want to go from physics, which is time reversible, to irreversibility. That is a mistake in logic. You, you cannot do it. And he finally pushed back. He finally accepted that it is only, it's the arrow of time would be only a probabilistic concept due to our simplification. Therefore, the arrow of time is just an illusion, in a sense. So he resigned so uh, he, this uh, project, he, basically. He resigned, basically, this project because of controversies. And I think there are two elements which are new. One element is the discovery that the arrow of time is real and plays a basic constructive role in the physical universe. And that is a little related to my early work, to the work which led to, in fact, to my Nobel Prize.
One thing which changes the atmosphere, which changes the, I mean, our view, was the discovery that the flow of time is a re, uh, leads to new structures. Therefore, in my opinion, this can only mean that the new structures cannot be the results of our approximation. It's like you would say, gravitation is a result of our approximation. The dissipative structures as, are as real as the planetary system. And you, you discover new dissipative structures everywhere now. You see, there are a lot of uh, uh, examples known. Anyone summarizes, it's, it's structures that go from smaller complexity to larger complexity. To larger complexity. The main point is the bifurcation point. And that leads also to another aspect that at the bifurcation point you have many possibilities and one of these possibilities is realized. Therefore, it's not a deterministic theory. The, the, the theory of dissipative structure is a st statistical theory, a theory which deals with some part of probability, of randomness, you see. Therefore, again, you see the flow of time leads to, uh, to coherence, to new structures, to randomness. And therefore, the question of Boltzmann, of an, of, an, of an evolutionary world, becomes much more, uh, much more intense, much more actual. And what exactly did you discover that eventually led to your Nobel Prize? Well, I think what I discovered was precisely that far from equilibrium, you have these structures. You have the, a world of fluctuations. And I think that is really a key, key word. I mean, the world is a world full of fluctuations. I would like to say that with the discovery of the bifurcations and so on, you introduce a historical element in the description of nature. In my last book, I go even a little far, perhaps too far, and say the history of nature is like Sherazad, the Arabic nights, because Sherazad tells the stories and she, she interrupts to tell a more beautiful story, the more beautiful story. And in, in, in nature, you have the story of cosmology, inside which you have the story of matter, inside which you have the story of, of life and the story of man. So I think that is one very important element. element. I, I was associated to it, perhaps I exaggerated. You see, of course, you always know the best your own work. You see, but I think it is a very important element, which is really fundamental for the evolution of science. But, First of all, let us say that the simplest situations are indeed ruled by deterministic simple laws. If you take the pendulum, if you take the two-body motion of the Earth around the Sun and so on, Newton's equations are perfect. So the simple situations give us an example of laws in which Everything is certain, initial condition determines the future, there is no direction of time and so on. So the question is extrapolation. Are the simple situations a model of the universe? And that is a very, nice, a very easy temptation. Or are the exceptional situations? And as I, we see it now, there are more exceptional situations. And it is with the work of Poincaré at the end of the 19th century a work which was not appreciated so well till the 50s, you see, that we began to understand that there's something very different when you go beyond this simple situation, even if you remain in the f field of classical mechanics. For example, the three-body problem. The three-body problem is already a mystery. What is the problem? The problem is you have three bodies, like say, take sun, uh, uh, Earth and Jupiter, let's say, for example. Then, but take, forget about the other planets, you consider a three-body problem, which is in a bound state. In other words, they are rotating one in respect to the other. Then what you observe is that at some point, one of the bodies is ejected, and the two others come closer. But nobody knows today at which moment the body will be ejected, and nobody knows today which body will be ejected. And one of my friends who disappeared very recently, uh, Victor Zebe, has devoted 20 years of his life 
to make numerical experiments in this field. But still, it is already a non-predictable problem, still being a very simple problem. So, and what was really recognized by Poincaré is that even if the equations of Newton can be written, there are systems which you can solve the equation by perturbation techniques and systems where you cannot. Would you say that the position that you introduced is that the lack of determinism in nature is, is not due to the lack of knowledge of initial conditions, exactly. whatever, but due to the physical nature itself? Exactly. That's exactly my position. Now, this position has to be justified mathematically. And the question is, in a sense, that the problem is, can probability, in contrast with individual trajectories or wave functions, lead to new properties? And in a sense, my point of view is that the arrow of time is a property which is a statistical property, a property which appears only if you consider an ensemble and not if you consider a single trajectory or a single Schrodinger equation, a wave equation. And this will actually give us more knowledge about nature of than course. considering Be trajectories. Of course. In a sense, exactly like you cannot make sociology of, of uh, uh, individual, you cannot understand sociology on studying isolated humans. You have to study them in their interaction. And in, in some sense, of course, analogy is a little rough. You can say, you can only understand nature by studying it on the statistical level. Of course, not for all systems. Again, there are a number of systems where the statistical description is identical to the individual description. And that are the situations where classical mechanics or quantum mechanics applies. But then there are situations where you need the statistics. And the simplest case is a chaos. The simplest case is chaos because there you would need an infinite precision to speak about trajectory. Mm. This is, of course, the, the, the also controversial and a new part of your thinking and your research. You write somewhere in your book, uh, basically, that trajectories are in themselves result of probability uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. calculations. In some cases. In some cases. In but some would cases. you say that, that, how would you explain to a, to a person that, that basically this table or, or, or this chair is, is in a way the outcome of, of probability, uh, uh, that, that the probability theory actually will, will account for the fact that that we are here now and the chair stands where it stands and will stand there tomorrow. I think this is a very simple question because the very existence of the chair is the very fact that the world is not a homogeneous mixture but contains the solids, contains the air, contains liquids, is already the result of a probabilistic argument. The reality, like I see it with the arrow of time, is the world in construction. A construction which is going on with its arrow of time on all levels, with this narrative element. And of course, the mechanism of this construction is very different. I'm not a neurophysiologist, and I shall not speak about the way in which time is acting on the brain. But and, uh, how time is acting on cosmology is a very different problem. But what is common in the whole universe is the direction of time. And I think that is it's impossible to ignore this. That is really the only common factor is that you age in the same direction as I age, planets age in the same direction as you age and I age, a, a rock, a piece of rock and a piece of, of, of solid or a piece of live, uh, a plant, all age in the same direction, not with the same mechanism, but in the same direction. Therefore, it is very natural that science should include this very important cosmological element into the basic description. And that is what I have tried to do. But what is time then? What, 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 what properties does it I, have? I, time is change, irreversible change. It's a common element. What is money? 
Your money, I have some here, but... Uh, yes, well, you can say time, I, seconds, many minutes, years, but the mechanism of change is uh, different. You should not, one should not imagine that time is a one-dimensional time. But the arrow of time uh, would, uh, would make you think of a goal, you know, as a road and you go someplace, uh, an arrow is a direction, isn't it? But in your universe, there is no, you, we don't know where we go. We only know that the, there is an arrow of time, but there is it's an undeterministic universe that you are introducing. Well, you see, you come now to very difficult questions. Our universe is in a highly non-equilibrium situation. Therefore, it can produce more and more non-equilibrium structures. And we know that it can go from one bifurcation to another bifurcation. It can introduce new species of animals, new viruses, new things. New Every, galaxies, new, new galaxies stars. And so on. Because it's a non-equilibrium situation. Now, if you ask a question on huge time intervals, then you have to ask the question, will the universe always be in non-equilibrium? Or will it go to equilibrium? Will it go to thermal death? Then it, then it has a very simple goal, death. Now, I don't believe in it. I don't believe that the only possibility for the universe is death, either death through thermal equilibrium, either death through the big crunch. In a sense, I don't believe it as long as I have not a good theory of the starting point of the universe, or what is the mechanism of the Big Bang. Because we don't know if small Big Bangs are not going on all the time and maintain the, the non-equilibrium state of the universe. In a sense, the idea what is the universe is a very difficult question because we know that there are states of negative energy, positive energies, we can go from negative energy to positive energies. So I like to say the world is not like an apple which has been falling from the tree and can only be destroyed. It is still in contact with the same forces which gave rise to it. And therefore it's very difficult to make any prediction about the future of the universe as long as we don't have a good theory of cosmology. And that is not for tomorrow. But you say this is a return to realism in uh, this, this way of thinking that you have. At the same time you introduce as this, the basic element well, chance, statistics, probabilities. Einstein said that, that God never don't, doesn't play dice, never play dice. Uh, you seem to say that there is an element of, of dice. Anyway. Yes, there's an element, but of course it's not pure chance. There are possibilities, there's a question of choice between different possibilities. Like when you have a bifurcation, you have some possibilities which appear and only statistically can determine what are the probabilities of one or the other. Our universe has a dominance of electrons. Another universe could have a dominance of positrons. So in a sense, reality is only a special case of possibilities. And that is something which Bergson emphasized, and I think it's completely true, that reality is not unique. You see, in the classical perspective, there's only one reality but I think reality is only part of many possibilities. Now, it is true that it is, it is less simple than deterministic laws. But on the other hand, we, are not, we have not to, to make, uh, we have not created the universe. Science has the aim of describing the universe with all the complexities of the universe. And the complexity of the universe is there. We see the appearance of novelties. We see the appearance of butterflies, of, of, of new species, and so on and so on. It's very difficult to imagine that this is all pre-programmed. It's very difficult to imagine that Michelangelo was pre-programmed when he made the slaves or the 16 chapel. It's very difficult when you see Neolithic art, as you see in this room, that it's all programmed. It, it, it seems that novelty is part of, of the uh, universe. Very slowly, and with much resistance, even from my own co-workers, I came to the idea that we have to extend classical and quantum mechanics. 
And even many of my co-workers who contributed very much to my other type of work could not believe in it. And it took really, it's only in the last years that we had developed the right mathematics to justify it, which is related to operator theory. Can one say that uh, we have waited for the tools, mathematically yeah. and perhaps also computer tools, yeah. to and do the calculations? To, to the courage, to, to, uh, to dare to say the things. You see, I, uh, I, I like often to mention the anecdote of, of Heisenberg saying that the difference between a good theoretical physicist and the abstract painter, that the abstract painter wants to be as original as possible, and the good theoretical physicist has to be as conservative as possible. I believe that I was as conservative as possible. And it's only because I was forced into this direction that I could not see any other outcome. You see, I, I, you see it's a terrible statement to say I want to generalize classical mechanics or quantum mechanics because in a sense I want in this sense I claim that I want to give a new direction to physics after 300 years of Newtonian views. Therefore I understand it's an enormous statement and I was very hesitant to go into this direction. It's not only 300 years of Newtonian views it's 2,300 years of Western thinking. Of Western thinking. You see. And therefore, I was very hesitant to do it. And I did it only because I was really forced to do it. And we shall see, of course, in the next generation, how far we can go in this direction. Are you, do you feel daring in doing this? Do you feel that you are, what we say in Swedish, no, on, on no, thin I ice? No? no, I feel that, in a sense, it was, a, you see, the a natural outcome of my strange position between the two cultures. I was always interested in art, in archaeology, in, in music, and at the same time in science. And I, I felt a kind of, of schism, of duality. And Eddington has written somewhere that the problem of time is an essential problem in every attempt to, to make, bring closer the spiritual life and the description of nature. And I think that is true, but it was it's also the most controversial point. And I'm still amazed by the intensity of antagonistic feelings. You see, for some people, I'm a traitor to science. And I'm a traitor because I, I destroy the authority of science by saying that not everything is certain. And you see, uh, many people had their opinion either Newton, either Jesus, and therefore by, by decreasing the, new, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, range of Newtonian physics, I was a mysticist, I was a traitor to science. And in a sense, I think just opposite, because if really the universe is an automaton, then you really need somebody to start the automaton. If the universe is self-organizing, you have the choice. Is the self-organization imminent? or coming from some external uh, planning, that is something which is far beyond what you can even conceive at to answer at the moment. Therefore, it's a question of personal choice. And I think we, have, we are all astonished by this strange universe. We have to be very tolerant. But you see, so in a sense, I believe just my, my, my role, if, my, if I can speak about my role, is much more in the other direction, you see. But certainly it is the direction of bringing closer the two cultures in the sense of snow, which character, the dichotomy of which characterizes Western civilization. But you feel yourself very much as, as a scientist in this, in this field. <laughs> that is true. And you hope to, to have this theory proven in the rigorous ways yes, that... Yes, of that, course, uh, of course. But still you talk about a new kind, if this is true or half true or on the way to, to a more, more true than, than the previous ones, you talk about a new science. What will be, be the characteristics of this new science, uh, basically? A new science means a science which is not based on certainties, which introduces probability on the fundamental level. Therefore, which is a science in which we cannot say what will happen tomorrow, but what may happen tomorrow. It's a little the science which you hear it every day when you speak about meteorological predictions. You see it, um, uh, Karl Popper, had the, he, he spoke about the physics of clouds and clocks. Well, we come to the physics of clouds. 
you see, which is a different physics from the physics of clocks. Until now, we have looked to science very much to try to understand who we are and what kind of society it, we That is still true. I don't think that this has changed. But before, there was the question, are we automata without knowing it? In social sciences, the, the idea was, on economic sciences, the idea was always to try to imitate the hard sciences. Now hard sciences give other models. And that is the reason why many things like self-organization, uh, bifurcation and so on, are being exported to human sciences. But of course, one has to be very careful because the decision making is a very different process. You see, the bifurcation process is very different. In humans, you have the pa memory of the past, anticipation of the future, and so on, which de de determines. But that makes even the problem more complex. The problem of humans is even more uncertain than the problem of uh, elsewhere. But in a sense, we come to the fact that there is a, a march of possibilities of construction in the universe which in the human life is reflected by freedom, by human freedom, by the choice. And of course, the choice is something which leads to, to anxiety. It's interesting that you introduce choice now, because we also live in times where biology is doing a lot of progress. And, and now you have this idea that we are all biological, not automatons, but, but very strictly biologically determined uh, who we are and what we will become. To some extent, but not completely. For example, the brain is not determined completely genetically. It depends on the environment, you see. But it is true that there are some elements which are determined genetically and others which are not. And the brain is not. And it, when you take twins, uh, well, the twins may have a very different developments if they don't live together. So I think we are in a world of mixture of determinism and, and probabilities. You don't see a risk that determinism will come back uh, the biological way in, no, in the, our no, thinking? No, 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 no. Certainly, certainly, uh, uh, I think our psychological life is a very proof, I would say, of, of the fact that determinism is not universal. And the question is, in a sense, that in the classical view, we had this dualism about which we spoke already, that then the world of our intelligent life would be separated from the world. Time was separating men from nature. And what I try to say is man expresses some deep elements of nature in a, in a more stronger way, but it's not separated. The unity of man and nature is something which is, I think, very deeply rooted at the end of the century. I mean, that is, a, that is we, many people feel this kind of transcendental element that we belong to something. Uh, some people call it, may you call it God, some people may call it nature, whatever you want to call it. But there is an element of belonging. And I think that is what also is expressed in the type of scientific view which I, I, I try to develop. So you're saying there is a room for, for God or religion also in this uh, scientific... That, but I, as, again, I emphasize that is going beyond science and I have no no advice to give and no opinion to, to state. You write somewhere that you regard science as a dialogue between um, with nature, with, between man and nature, basically. And, and as in a true dialogue, the results are sometimes unexpected and sometimes astonishing. Yes. What has astonished you most during your dialogue with nature? Well, the, the way in which it creates through non-equilibrium structures. And the way in which you can mathematize this, I think that is a very, very interesting. Do you, do you, have you gotten this Eureka feeling that sometimes everything comes to place and of you course. realize that you of ha course. have seen something that yes. no one else has seen before you? Or at least I, I, not I think so, to some extent. You see, and I always, over all my life, I like to give uh, uh, seminars, lectures, to see the reaction of people. You see, science is a rather difficult enterprise because what is the limit between obstination and perseverance? You see, in a sense, when you have new ideas, the new ideas, in my case at least, appear in a, 
in a not clear way, in an intuitive way. And they have to be still modified and changed and so on. And so I, I hoped always that through my interactions with other people, I could learn how to improve it. And to some extent, this is true. I had very good, and I have very good young students, which are from home. I learned a lot. But the ma basic problem is always how far should you go? And the reaction to my initial pr pr proposal to extend classical quantum mechanics was so poor that if I would not per continue, probably it would take again some, some decades, like it took for, since Boltzmann till somebody else will, will, will do the same thing. Another bifurcation in... Another bifurcation. Uh, bifurcation. Uh, you're, this, we're sitting in your house now in Brussels. It's, it's surrounded with, with art and sculptures, and, and there is a piano behind you. How much, which role does all this play in your thinking? When, you see, uh, I mean, uh, when you look on the various works of art which are here, you will see that the most belong to Neolithic art. And Neolithic art for me is very interesting because it represents various ways of seeing the world. You see, my Paleolithic art is rather similar everywhere, be it in South America, be it in Spain, be it in Australia. You see the animals and you see some geometrical pattern. But when you go to Neolithic art, it's very different because you see you have the cosmic aspects of, of Chinese art in which men plays a relatively small role. What time are we talking about, basically? We speak about 3,000 before Christ, let's say. Then you have the Egyptian art, which is very confident, because there's a confidence in eternal life, and to some extent also Greek art with a confidence in human. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, South American art, of which you see here many examples, is an art of anxiety. Because the word is a biological word. Motion is not given for nothing. You see, in, in the Aristotelian view, uh, motion is for nothing, essentially, motion of celestial bodies. And in the Newtonian theory, also, motion corresponds to an equilibrium between gravitation and centrifugal forces. But in the Mayan and Aztec and other South American civilization, mm -hmm. the, the motion is a biological act which requires energy. And therefore, you have to give the gods energy through sacrifices. And this introduces a, an element of anxiety. And this anxiety of the, uh, of the South American and Central American Neolithic art is very close to, to our anxiety, because we also are anxious. We see a new universe. We are in a period of transition. Is this a progress or not? We can come back to this, you see. But anyway, we are in the progress in a moment of astonishment. And astonishment is also, always a question of, of anxiety. And therefore, I, I have more relations, and you will see more objects of South America and Central America than from any other civilization. Is, is there a concept of progress in your, in your thinking? Well, I think yes. And I think there is a, you see, at the end of the century, one thing is clear, science has changed very much. All the information, science, communication, biology, and whatsoever is completely new. On the other hand, society has changed very much. For example, I always emphasize inequality has decreased. Inequality between nations. At the beginning of the century, you had the civilized and the non-civilized, which could be treated more or less like animals. Now, this is no more possible. We recognize we have left our Eurocentric point of view to some extent. Also, the relation between the various classes have changed. Uh, and even the relation the family have changed. Therefore, I think there is a change. Can you call it a progress? It seems to me, yes. It, and it, this progress has been made possible by the advances of science, of course. There are, there are uh, dark points, we have, we have Africa, uh, Rwanda, uh, Yugoslavia. But I feel that science indirectly has a great ethical value. 
But that is one of my points where I don't like to make the distinction between the two cultures. Because in fact, our human culture is deeply influenced by the scientific culture. But isn't there a contradiction slightly anyway with the idea of progress and the idea of uncertainty? Not at all, because the idea of uncertainty is a very initial condition for novelty. And novelty is our hope. Why? Novelties could be the other way around. That is true. Novelty is a risk. That is why I'm not saying novelty is a certainty. Uh, it's related automatically to a progress. But what I say is novelty is a hope. But it is hope we realized or not. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a futurologue. But it gives you possibilities. And certainly over my lifetime, there was progress. After all, my generation, when I was young, I, I, I was living at the same time as Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, Franco, and company. And uh, the situation has improved. So I have an optimistic view. But of course, it's very dangerous to extrapolate and to say that in 50 years, the situation will be even better. But certainly, science gives new possibilities. But also new responsibilities, new resp in the way you formulate yes, it anyway. Yes, yes, but why not? <laughs>